love it. Anyway, and it's going to take some in for like eight years. Good morning, everybody. I want to welcome all of you to the annual Sybin and Sybin Lecture. I am delighted to see so many of you, especially so many students in the audience, uh, since I know it's quite a sacrifice to come out a week before exams. But everything I have seen in the last half hour or so from Professor Bix makes me think we're in for a fascinating and entertaining <coughs> lecture, although he has assured me it will not be entertaining. But I have trouble believing that he can hold his personality back. But we will see. Now, let me introduce to you uh, the person who has made uh, this year's lecture um, actually, or lecturer, uh, possible, uh, who selects wonderful people from around the country uh, to teach us more about family law. And that is our own uh, Professor John DeWitt Gregory, uh, the Simon and Simon Professor in Family Law. And he has the honor of introducing Professor Brian Bix to us today. Professor Gregory. I'm grateful to all of you have, who have taken the time during this busy end of the academic year to attend the lecture this morning. Uh, I am well aware of the fact that thanking individuals carries the risk of offending someone who is omitted, but there are some whom it would shame me uh, not to mention. Uh, the Dean's office, including Dean Demleiter herself and Vice Deans Michelle Wu and Miriam Alpert, have personally involved themselves in the preparation for this lecture. Uh, Jeff Dodge has sent several announcements and reminders to our alumni, at least some of whom I saw entering the room, and faculty members have encouraged students to attend. And finally, Dawn Marzella seems to have done absolutely everything. Each time that I thought, here comes my 19th nervous breakdown, there were Dawn's assurances that even though I was uptight, everything was all right. <laughs> and so it was, and so it is. Uh, let me turn now to our speaker today, Professor Brian Bix. His introduction, as I have warned him, will be brief, because you have come to hear him and not his introducer. Uh, therefore, I shall leave the biographical details to the quite modest account of his career that is printed on the invitation. First, you have surely noted that Professor Bix is the Frederick W. Thomas Professor of Law and Philosophy at the University of Minnesota. Now, natterings among the Law Academy about multidisciplinary this and interdisciplinary that have recently become quite trendy, regardless of the reality. But with Professor Brian Bix holding appointments as he does in two sectors of a leading university, we have that rara avis, the real thing. Beyond that, Brian Bix, if I may call you Brian, informally, is a player. If you have participated in any significant project or symposium in family law in the last several years, chances are that you have met Brian. For those who keep track of such things, and I know that some of us do, Brian Bix has published an impressive array of books, articles, book chapters, research papers, and the like in leading law reviews and other academic outlets. Simply stated, he is, as I have said, a player in the field of family law, which is, of course, the most dynamic area in the law school curriculum. <laughs> there is one other thing. There is one other thing that has always been an indispensable characteristic for Simon lecturers over the years. That is, Brian Bix is a really nice cat. <laughs> I give you the Frederick W. Thomas Professor of Law and Philosophy at the University of Minnesota, Brian H. Bix.
extraordinarily generous talk, it, it becomes clear that if you had some judgment, you would come here to hear John and not me, but uh, that's not what the contract states. So, uh, let me thank very much the law school. Uh, thank uh, John very much for his kind and generous invitation, as well as his generous introduction. Let me thank also uh, family and friends who have come from very far away, including uh, my father-in-law, Seymour Helfan, my parents, uh, and my, of course, my wife, Karen. Um, the topic is domestic agreements, which I, um, she hasn't expressly said as much, but I think she treats as something like military intelligence, domestic <laughs> agreements. Um, but be that as it may, um, it's a great pleasure to be here at the Hofstra Law School. Like everyone else who takes family law seriously, I owe a great deal to many of its faculty members, and I'm in awe of a school that can amass such an impressive array of theorists, analysts, and practitioners in this most important but frequently neglected area of legal scholarship. And it's a great honor to give the 2007 Sidney and Walter Seidman Distinguished Professorship Lecture. And I'm grateful to the law firm of Seidman and Seidman for their generous funding of this lecture series, as well as so many other great family law events here at Hofstra. And to be asked to give this lecture is to be included in an impressive club, among whom are some of the most exemplary figures in family law, including my current faculty colleagues, Robert J. Levy and Judith T. Younger. I have strong doubts that I'm worthy of this company, but I will do my best to warrant the honor you have given me today. In the brief time we have together, I want to explore the treatment of certain domestic agreements in family law to see what can be learned about law and about families. It is a cliche in discussions of family law and agreements to point to Sir Henry Maine's famous quotation that society has moved from status to contract. I will not disappoint expectations here. The main quotation is usually offered ironically and perhaps defiantly in family law articles as this is one area where status has stoutly and largely successfully resisted being overtaken by contract. Status remains important, both practically and symbolically, because in family law, the state guards its prerogatives in setting status. <clears throat> it was once the case that the status that mattered most in family was marital status. <clears throat> Not only was this the only context in which sexual behavior was legally authorized and socially condoned, it was also the status that determined one's rights or lack thereof over children. Married parents had full rights and obligations. Children of unmarried parents were legally filius nilius, the children of no one. It is not that marital status has entirely lost importance. As debates over same-sex marriage make crystal clear, this status continues to have great significance to many who fight vigorously to be allowed into the club or to keep others out. However, I think it equally clear that it is parental status that now has primary importance in American family law. And this remains an area where the states have been slow, arguably much too slow, in letting parental status be in part established by or modified by agreement. This talk will focus on a series of situations in which parties attempt to affect parental status or parental rights through agreements. I'll first look at co-parenting agreements between same-sex parents. I'll then turn to separation agreements, thirdly, premarital agreements, and the final section will discuss agreements with sperm and egg donors and briefly also mention surrogacy agreements. The response to these different sorts of agreements varies widely. The possible state responses to such agreements include substantial deference to party autonomy, distrustful and hesitant partial recognition of party choice, or a defiant refusal to enforce the agreements in any way. The current treatment of domestic agreements can be understood in terms of the state setting boundaries on the ability of individuals to affect status by contract. There was a time, some centuries back, when the state did not concern itself with marital status at all, but left such matters either to individuals or to the church and to church courts. 
However, from the point when the state got into the business of regulating marital status, it has been rigid in guarding its boundaries. And the modern state remains a jealous guardian of marital status, even as that status begins to mean less and less. <coughs> One thing we will see along the way is how anomalous the law's treatment is towards co-parenting agreements, with the states turning its back on parents who want to be responsible for children. The question is not merely whether the courts should change their attitude towards these agreements, though I certainly think they should, but what we might learn in turn from these anomalies in the state's treatment. So first to co-parenting agreements. A same-sex couple is interested in having and raising a child together. In the state in which they live, however, they are not allowed to marry, and state law also does not allow them to create equal parental status through step-parent adoption. The parents try to help themselves by entering into a detailed agreement in which they commit to each other that they want both parents to be <coughs> legal parents of the child and that neither will challenge the parental status of the other. Such co-parenting agreements have been regularly written, and when things go well, we hear no more about them. However, when one does come across cases where such couples, come, such couples break up, and then despite the agreement, one of the partners tries to exclude the other from parental rights. For example, consider these facts from a 1991 case here in New York. Petitioner Allison D. and respondent Virginia M. established a relationship in September 1977, began living together in March 1978. In March 1980, they decided to have a child and agreed that respondent would be artificially inseminated. Together they planned for the conception and birth of the child and agreed to share jointly all rights and responsibilities of childhood. In July 1981, respondent gave birth to a baby boy who was given petitioner's last name as his middle name and respondent's last name became his last name. Petitioner shared in all birthing expenses and after the son's birth, continued to provide for his support. During the son's first two years, petitioner and respondent jointly cared for and made decisions regarding the child. In November 1983, when the child was two years old, petitioner and respondent terminated the relationship and petitioner moved out of the home they jointly owned. Petitioner and respondent agreed to a visitation schedule whereby petitioner continued to see the child a few times a week. Petitioner also agreed to continue to pay one half the mortgage and major household expenses. By this time, the child had referred to both respondent and petitioner as mommy. Petitioner's visitation with the child continued until 1986, at which time respondent bought out petitioner's interest in the house and then began to restrict petitioner's visitation with the child. In 1987, petitioner moved to Ireland to pursue career opportunities, but continued her attempts to communicate with the child but thereafter, respondent terminated all contact between petitioner and the child, returning all petitioner's gifts and letters. In this case, as in nearly every case involving a co-parenting agreement, the excluding parent's decision was supported by the courts. The other partner was entirely excluded from the child's life, a child she had done everything to help raise. Additionally, one should note that in the few cases where the court denies the parent the right to exclude his or her partner, that is, where the partner retains some right of contact with the child, that decision is rarely grounded on the party's express agreement, but rather is based on the partner's acquisition of some quasi-parental status through his or her actions. It's hard to find the words to describe the removal of a parent, or if you some would object that this begs the question, let one say, the removal of someone who has been acting in the role of a parent. It's hard to describe the removal of such a person from a child's life, and the child from that person's life, and this after a solemn promise was made not to do this action. Many appalling things happen in this world, but I doubt that there are many harms more shameful than this where it is also the case that the perpetrator publicly seeks judicial approval for her actions and has a good chance of obtaining it. I would add that the effort to exclude the other partner would be shameless even without the express agreement. If the agreement adds anything, perhaps it's only the removal of any ambiguity regarding the party's expectations. However, enough gratuitous editorializing. I want to look at these cases and see how they illuminate issues of choice and status in family law. 
Let's begin with the basics. The legal custodians of a child have the right to authorize another person to spend time with the child and to provide care for the child. The state imposes few limits on that right. At the extreme, certain companions and caregivers may be so harmful to a child that leaving the child in such company would be a justified basis for suspension or termination of parental rights. But that, those cases, thankfully, are rare and highly exceptional. However, in general, allowing or directing access is a central part of what caregivers do. The Supreme Court's decision in Troxell versus Granville, the grandparent visitation case, can be seen as turning on the constitutional right of legal parents to control the child's access to grandparents and to other third parties. Co-parenting agreements are about one person giving the other advanced permission to spend time with a child, purporting to waive his or her rights to object at a later time. Looking at this in the most general terms, there's nothing unusual here. This is, after all, the basic structure of all promises and agreements. The reductions of one's own future liberty often in exchange for a reciprocal reduction by another party. In this case, the restriction of one party's parental prerogatives is likely given in exchange for the other party's commitment to parent, to contribute to the care, comfort, and support of the child. However, this is not the way the government, through the court system, sees these agreements. Why are the courts usually so friendly to enforcing private agreements, so unfriendly here. As we will see, the courts, though perhaps suspicious generally of domestic agreements, are significantly more receptive to enforcing separation agreements than premarital agreements. Perhaps the government's response to co-parenting agreements can be understood as expressing the view that such agreements are problematic because they are long-term, because they are irrevocable consents to visits. It's not just you can look after my child or visit with my child this afternoon. Co-parent agreements are more of a blanket or irrevocable permission to be with the child for the indefinite future. Perhaps this looks like a radical waiver of rights for which the government should protect us. Or perhaps it just looks like a one-sided promise that's just too unconscionable to enforce. However, that is to underestimate the value of enforceable promises, as well as to forget that co-parenting agreements are bargains not just one-sided promises. The ability to make long-term commitments is not best understood as a limit to the parent's or potential parent's freedom, but rather as an enhancement of it. In this case, the ability to make a binding commitment, or at least a commitment the other person reasonably believes to be binding, gains one parent and a child significant gains over months and years. The only question is whether the state will enforce the exchange already made. Would one side, having received significant benefits, now trying to renege on the deal rather than give what was offered in return for those benefits? Of course, one should keep in mind the general truth that the state has little concern with agreements as such. People can, on the whole, make whatever arrangements they like as long as such matters are kept between the parties. The problems only arise when an agreement is not kept and one party seeks the state's help in coercing the other party to abide by the terms of the agreement or the state's help in this case, in excluding another person from a child's life. Back to the point. It is a common place to point out that the ability to enter into binding commitments enhances our options significantly. In this particular case, the ability to make a binding commitment may allow someone to convince her partner to go forward with parenthood. This is a significant benefit that comes only with bindingness. In other contexts, like separation agreements, the courts do go some way towards allowing parties to make binding long-term arrangements regarding their children. One should also know that the court decisions in co-parenting cases often are grounded partly or wholly on the interpretation of particular statutes, maybe legislation limiting those who are allowed to petition for visitation. However, one can frequently respond to opinions grounded this way that there remains the argument that the court's reading of the legislation has been unduly restrictive and formalistic especially compared to how the courts have treated other re legislation relating to domestic relations. At times when reading co-parenting agreement cases, it's hard to escape the suspicion that disapproval of homosexuality in general and same-sex couples and same-sex parents in particular is driving the court's reasoning and conclusions. At the least, there seems to be a desire not to give a legal <coughs> imprimatur indirectly to same-sex relationships 
or directly to same-sex parenting. However, to be fair, one should perhaps not view the state treatment of co-parenting agreements as always or only reflecting an animus to same-sex couples, as something comparable occurs even with opposite sex and married parents. When opposite sex married parents try to assign or waive rights regarding parenting after divorce through premarital agreements assigning visitation rights or custodial rights, or creating boundaries regarding religious upbringing, the courts consistently <coughs> refuse to enforce such agreements. The states view co-parenting agreements as interference with their role, with the state's role, to protect the best interests of children. This is a protection the states bestow through the combination of determining parental status and guarding, and guarding the prerogatives of parents. Sometimes the courts ground refusal to recognize co-parenting agreements on the constitutional rights of parents, but as discussed above, this is at least too quick. This is not a simple case of the state granting third party rights with no consent of any kind from the legal parents. These are instead cases of a legal parent giving consent at an earlier time, making a commitment to continued assent, and then violating that commitment and seeking the court's approval for the violation. This in turn is often justified as a way of declaring that a household with opposite sex married parents is the optimal context in which to raise children. The argument is based on the further claim, sometimes unstated, that withholding rights from other household arrangements will encourage more marital parenting. This line of argument, though common, is deeply flawed. Among the problems to consider is that even if married opposite sex parents are optimal, it doesn't mean that other forms of parenting are harmful. Even if other forms of parenting are harmful in some sense, any benefit obtained by encouraging optimal parenting must be balanced against the harm done to those parents and those children left without legal protections. While, and third, while it's possible that some people who would otherwise enter same-sex partnerships might instead enter traditional marriages because of the greater legal benefits, one can question how many would do so and the relative stability of those relationships. In any event, one should note the difference between the present context of co-parenting agreements by same-sex couples and other contexts where the relative merit of different parenting options comes up. For example, in the context of foster care or adoption policies, the question often is what is the best setting for some existing child needing care? By contrast, co-parenting agreements relate to the creation of a new child and maintaining legal protections for such a child not the optimal placement amongst various alternatives for a child already in being. In the few cases where the right of parties to co-parenting agreements have been recognized, the decision upholding those rights was usually grounded not on the agreement, as I mentioned, but rather on the de facto parental role that the party had. This leads to a different line of inquiry. How strongly do I want to push the importance of enforcement of agreements here? What if a legal parent entered an agreement to recognize rights of access, as I say, rights of regular visitation, to someone who otherwise had no role in the child's life? Not the genetic parent, not the genetic donor, not a regular caretaker, not an income provider for the household. One response would be similar to what the courts have done, that agreements are relevant only when the non-parent partner has had a role sufficiently like a parent that it deserves official recognition. And the role of agreement is simply to clarify the party's intentions in ambiguous circumstances. This would seem to be the expected circumstances for the vast majority of co-parenting agreements, but it might overcome some opposition to a general enforcement of co-parenting agreements to make this a formal requirement. A second possibility would be that agreements should only be enforceable where the non-parent partner has relied upon them in substantial ways as in the example of partners who only go forward with having and raising a child once both are assured that they are not at risk of being cut off later. Let me turn, by way of contrast, to separation agreements. The most deferential treatment of party choice in terms of enforcing such agreements occurs with separation agreements, which set the terms of divorce for the vast majority of couples who have their marriages dissolved. For such agreements, the deference is substantial, though not total. In principle, courts are to review the financial terms between the parties covered by the agreement for basic fairness and to give a hard look to the child-centered terms of custody, visitation, and child support. By most accounts, however, in practice, courts are generally rubber stamps, at least when the parties present the agreement without further objection. 
where one of the parties now objects to the separation agreement he or she had earlier signed, the court is more likely to give the agreement a substantive review, especially if the claim is that the agreement acts against the best interest of the children. One might note that the general rule is that parenting agreement arrangements are also subject to review and modification by a later court challenge. They are less not effectively indefinite waivers of rights as a co-parent agreement purports to be. This is true, though one should also consider that many jurisdictions require a waiting period from the finalization of divorce to any effort to modify, and some also impose waiting periods between one attempt to modify and the next one. It's important to note that enforcement here, when it occurs, is frequently stronger than that offered for conventional contracts. For when separation agreements are accepted as reasonable by the court and incorporated into the final divorce decree, the terms of the agreement become orders of the court subject to enforcement by contempt. No one is claiming that separation agreements are ideal. Even in the best of circumstances, these agreements are frequently entered into circumstances where one or both parties might be feeling emotional distress or financial coercion. These are deviations from knowing consent that might cause judges to pause before enforcement in a more conventional agreement. Also, a one-sided separation agreement can leave spouses and children in near poverty. Sometimes parties come to their senses after signing on to a separation agreement and ask a judge not to enter the agreement, but judges will usually reject signed agreements only in a small percentage of cases, and usually only where the unfairness of the financial terms is quite egregious. Separation agreements are not as radical as co-parenting agreements, as they do not purport to grant parental rights and obligations beyond state-granted beyond what state-granted status already provides. Similarly, a separation agreement is not a complete withdrawal of parental rights, as some sperm and egg donation agreements to be discussed later effectively are. And finally, unlike premarital agreements, separation agreements deal with divorce as an imminent event, rather than as a speculative and perhaps hard to imagine for a future contingency. We understand the reason for the court's deference on separation agreements. First and foremost, divorces settled by agreement do not need to be settled by further litigation with all that means for saved court time, saved party resources, and less hostility between the parties. There's additionally the idea that an agreed settlement is more likely to reflect the party's needs, preferences, and interests than an imposed settlement, with all that might mean for greater party satisfaction and compliance. There are simply too many practical reasons to respect party autonomy and few reasons of principle to object, so most separation agreements are enforced as written. Another contrast is premarital agreements. Until approximately 30 years ago, agreements entered by a couple prior to marriage setting the financial terms of any subsequent divorce were unenforceable as contrary to public policy. <coughs> Under these agreements, one partner, usually though not always the wife, agrees to waive some or all of her rights to property or alimony upon divorce and return, it is said, for the other party's agreement to get married. Many of these agreements involved a wealthier partner who had already gone through a prior divorce with property division and alimony payments and wanted to avoid having to take on a comparable financial obligation should the new marriage also end. A somewhat different sort of story is told by partners who had children from a prior marriage and want to make sure that certain properties went to those children or their grandchildren despite whatever obligations might arise from the new marriage. These divorce-focused premarital agreements were said to encourage divorce in the sense that they make divorce easy, that is, less costly for one of the partners, even if they simultaneously make divorce more costly for the other. <coughs> Alternatively, the agreements were rejected on the related grounds that they purported to change the terms of status set by and protected by the state. Here again, the courts guarded their prerogative over status. If status meant anything, it was that a certain position in society, here spouse, carried certain rights and obligations that could not be altered even by agreement of the two persons most interested in the relationship. A married couple could generally run their marital life as they saw fit, but they could not expect state enforcement of agreements or arrangements that vary the terms set by the state. In the bad old days of gendered rules regarding marriage, this meant that the husband could not waive his right to determine the domicile of the couple, and the wife could not waive her right of support. <coughs> One can still find cases in validating agreements where the consideration involves either spouse waiving his or her right to care, that is, to receive care. Slowly, courts changed their attitudes about divorce-focused premarital agreements. Now it's the case that no jurisdiction treats such agreements as per se unenforceable, 
Though many jurisdictions will enforce only those agreements that, per that pass certain criteria of fairness. The basic underlying message of the change in attitude interests me. States are now more willing to let the parties set the terms of their own marriages, within certain limits. We need to consider the legal and social context. We live in a society, a society now where both as a matter of legal regulation and social norms, there is limited constraint over when and where and whether people marry. It's also a context with limited legal and social constraint on whether married couples stay married. And finally, we live in a time when legally divorce is no longer either rare or granted only to innocent and victimized spouses. And socially, at least in most communities, there is little stigma associated with divorce. Taking all this into account, there seems little reason to stop couples who want to enter marriage but on slightly altered terms. Where the state and society seem less concerned on who gets married and who stays married, one can see the argument for telling the state that it should allow marriage on terms altered by the parties. However, there's an additional consideration pointing in the other direction. We also have a state and a community much more accepting of cohabitation outside of marriage. One could reasonably ask, where cohabitation is, accepted, is an accepted alternative to marriage, why should the state admit couples to marriage on anything other than the state's preferred terms? And the inverse need also be asked, why do parties want to marry, especially if they do not like the terms on which the state offers marriage? And if cohabitation outside of marriage is available, and many arrangements between the parties can be achieved by contract and other legal documents. One part of the answer from the perspective of the partners is that there remains something of symbolic importance about being married, with all of the historical, traditional, and religious connotations that marriage still carries. One might also note that the state and federal benefits available only or primarily to married couples. And there are limits to the state enforcement of premarital agreements. As mentioned, many states impose substantive limits on financial terms, either of general fairness or limiting the ability to waive spousal support. Additionally, all states refuse to enforce agreements that purport to affect child custody, visitation, or child support, or purport to limit the grounds for divorce. That is, states have become far more tolerant in allowing the couples to set the financial terms of the marriage they enter, but they remain protective about children and about controlling the ability to exit. There are three states that have allowed couples to enter in marriages to agree to a state-sponsored option of a more binding form of marriage, the so-called covenant marriage of Louisiana, Arkansas, and Arizona. But no states, to my knowledge, have been willing to enforce private agreements by couples entering marriage to place comparable restrictions on their ability to exit. On the subject of children, the contrast with separation agreements is interesting. Unlike premarital agreements, separation agreements can properly, can properly and enforceably deal with matters touching on obligation towards children. With separation agreements, the doctrine is that the court should not defer to the couple in the terms regarding children, but should offer an independent review to determine whether the terms are fair and in the children's <coughs> best interest. As mentioned, the reality is that by all accounts, courts usually rubber stamp these terms, especially if neither adult party to the separation agreement objects at the time the divorce is finalized. This may be as good a point as any to say a few words about, generally, about both contract law and family law, about how these areas are understood, or how through opinions and commentaries, the field's self-understanding, their self-presentation to the world. The paradigm of contract law is the agreement hammered out, hammered out by parties of roughly equal bargaining power operating at arm's length. However, the reality of modern contracting practice is that a large percentage of agreements are, in fact, not negotiated, but are presented on standardized form on a take-it-or-leave-it basis to consumers who have no power to force renegotiation and neither the time nor the expertise even to understand what they're saying. <coughs> Many premarital agreements and other domestic agreements, whatever their other faults, can look good by comparison. <coughs> they are usually not form contracts, and many states require disclosure and an opportunity to consult a lawyer, requirements rarely imposed in other agreements. Additionally, the negative terms of premarital agreements are not hidden behind more positive inducements, but are rather the main focus of the agreement. This is not to deny the, pro the problems such agreements still raise by way of power imbalances, bounded rationality, and other coercive circumstances. One might say that while contract law was once thought the arena of freedom of contract, obligations imposed to the extent, but only to the extent they are freely chosen, it's now a place where obligations are often largely determined by the interaction of company forms and government regulations. Family law might be thought to be a kind of mirror image, 
an area which focuses on the obligation and rights automatically connected with certain status, parent, child, spouse, with little to no room for alteration of these obligations and duties. This is changing, albeit slowly. Finally, then, I just want to look briefly at <coughs> parental rights of egg and sperm donors. An emerging area of discussion and litigation is domestic agreements involving gamete donors. Before considering this area, it's useful to consider the general background of agreements and parental rights. Someone, you, sometimes one comes across situations where a couple have informally reached an agreement under which, for example, the biological father would waive all rights to the resulting child in return for having no duties of child support. However much a couple may themselves want to waive the parental rights of one of the biological parents or think it might be a good idea, the parents cannot legally do so. It's a simple presumption that it's rarely in a child's best interest to have fewer adults with duties for the child's care. To put the point in the awkward terminology of economics so fashionable today, parental agreements waiving obligation to a child have strong negative externalities. The contrast with co-parenting agreements that the courts also resist is interesting. While an agreement by which a pr prospective parent tries to get out of parental status removes an adult permanently from a child's life, or at least removes the financial support, the co-parenting agreement is an effort to make sure that there is an additional second adult in the child's life. One countervailing consideration is the belief that having more than two legal parents may be contrary to the best interests of the child. This view either derives from or feeds into the visceral reaction many people have to polygamy. And is the present in the standard of the Uniform Parentage Act and the rules regarding step-parent adoption. At the same time, the resistance to multiple parents may be slowing ebb slowly ebbing away in the face of the reality of blended families where children face more, and sometimes many more, than two parental figures, functionally, if not legally. Returning to the topic of agreements with egg and sperm donors, such agreements usually occur against a background of statutory regulation or established case law, which holds that if certain requirements are met, the gamete donor is to have neither the rights nor the duties of a legal parent. A current dispute before the Kansas Supreme Court arises from a statute that holds that sperm donors have no parental rights unless the relevant parties enter into an express agreement to that effect. In the dispute before the court, the sperm donor was a friend of one of the intended parents, and he claims it was always expected that he would have a role in the child's life. While the dispute might turn on the policy argument be behind writing agreements, the statute of frauds, including the problems of proof in cases just like this one, the background issue is the state's willingness in these cases to allow a genetic parent not to have parental rights in order to encourage sperm donors in the use of donated sperm. But also at least where the parties expressly agree to allow to include sperm donors as parents where the parties so consent. An obvious connection can be drawn between these agreements and the further case of surrogacy agreements. And on one side, and agreements to place a child for adoption on the other. Both surrogacy agreements and agreements to place a child for adoption are agreements about the waiver of parental rights. However, surrogacy agreements are not enforceable in any state, though they are conclusive for determining parental status in California, and perhaps Illinois and a few other states. At least in those states, the agreements serve their essential purpose, transferring or establishing parental rights, even if the agreement itself may not be enforceable. Agreements to place one's child for adoption carry some suspicion in the law. Parents or at least mothers, are usually not allowed to consent effectively to an adoption until a certain time after birth, and are frequently given an additional period of time after consent in which, a change, in which to have a change of mind. However, after that time passes, consents to adoption, unlike the vast majority of surrogacy agreements, work as effective transfers of parental rights. One way to think about the different treatment of the various agreements affecting parental status is that the state or society should be naturally more favorably inclined to agreements that add a parent to a child's life than it is towards agreements by which someone tries to escape a parental role. Thus, we recognize why states will allow a biological parent to effectively waive another biological parent's rights and duties through, towards a child through an agreement. I'm sorry, well, states will not allow such an agreement. The state will recognize the waiver of parental rights by gamete donors and by parents giving up their children for adoption because in such cases the waiver is needed to effectuate the interests of other and usually better placed parents <coughs> over the role of parents. However, the analysis suggested only makes the state's attitude towards co-parenting agreements more mysterious. For here it is an effort to secure a second parent for a child who would otherwise have only, likely have only one legal parent. 
Still, one must note, as Justice Scalia commented in Michael H., the case of the adulterous biological father arguing against the marital presumption, that one party's rights can only be recognized at the cost of another party. In that case, the genetic father's rights was made to yield to the rights of the married couple. In co-parenting cases, the partner's rights is in conflict with the, parent, with the parental prerogatives of the biological parent. Some in the audience, I know, are very protective of the rights of parents. <laughs> and I certainly do not mean to denigrate the value of protecting parental rights. My only claim is that the value of promises combined with the benefit of being able to secure two legal parents for a child to be, creates a situation where the claims of a parent, narrowly understood, might need to yield. I began this talk with a predictable reference to Sir Henry Maine's assertion that the movement of progressive societies has been from status to contract. I noted that in family law, status still has great importance, and contract has made only gradual headway. In particular, I've argued states are very protective of the prerogatives of determining parental status. This is understandable in some contexts, perhaps even laudatory, though in other contexts it is less impressive. Certainly in dealing with co-parenting agreements by same-sex couples, nothing of great value is protected, and much of value is wasted by not enforcing co-parenting agreements. That law has always been skeptical of con contracts between intimates, and modern commentators have added concerns phrased in terms of exploitation and bounded rationality to historical concerns about public policy and government prerogatives. These are all real concerns, and not to be dismissed quickly. Nonetheless, I think we need to find more room for enforceable agreements in family law to understand the circumstances where no significant public interests are threatened and where the best interests of both children and their parents may even be furthered. Thank you. audience are willing uh, to post some questions uh, about this interesting and challenging topic. Uh, yes, please. At one point you were mentioning the changes that have already happened to marriage and cited divorce and divorce being more acceptable, and then said that since these changes have happened, we should be accepting of more changes. So why shouldn't those of us who are horrified by more divorce and, the norm and uh, people being more accepting of divorce say, okay, enough is enough, we're drawing the line and there will be no new changes, and if we can't even reverse the old changes? I, 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 I hope I should, I should have made the point clear. What I was saying is, in a current context where marital status has less legal and social significance than it once did, it's not I'm saying we should have more divorce. To the contrary, the enforcement of premarital agreements would likely, though not certainly, create more marriages. These are people saying, I'd like to get married, but on slightly altered terms. And if you think of marriage as a good in itself, even on altered terms, you would say, Okay, especially since there's less at stake. I said the converse question is, if there's less at stake legally and socially, why can't the state say, you know, perhaps sympathetic to your view here, look, we think this is the right way to do marriage. You do it on our terms or not at all. We're not, you know, we're not keeping you out of something, we're not keeping you out of the, you know, something crucial to your life. You, if you want to do it on different terms, you can, you can cohabit outside of marriage. So I'm not suggesting, you know, that divorce is a good thing. I'm suggesting that we have to look at the question, the policy question is different now where the legal and social significance of marriage is much less than it once was. Now I'm not clear which way it cuts, but I think that's, I, I'm trying to, it was partly a descriptive explanatory matter. Why is it that every state in the union now uh, enforces premarital agreements where 30 years ago basically none did? And I think it's because the you know, state says why, you know, why should we make a big deal about it? You look puzzled and non-responded to. I mean, it's okay. That's okay. That's all right. I didn't expect any better. Okay. Uh, yes, please. Um, I was wondering, as with respect to co-parenting agreements, as between a parent and a non-parent that takes on parental responsibilities who um, execute a co-parenting agreement, what kind of standard would you use to review that, that sort of agreement? Would you give any special consideration to the biological parent, or would you afford it the same kind of deference that, say, would be given to a separation agreement? I would say, I, for myself, if the, 
I understand co-op parenting agreements narrowly. I mean, I'm, I'm, the separation agreements, the one thing about separation agreements is they cover lots of things. You know, this is who gets this property and that property and visitation and custody. There's a lot going on. I understand co-parenting agreements narrowly, which is, um, I, you know, basically I waive my right to object to, you know, it's kind of an estoppel argument. I waive my right to object to, to any claim that you're not a legal parent. You will have the status of legal parent I will not challenge otherwise. I would say, I mean, what I suggested is that there be a minimal review, which is, um, has this person acted in some way as a parent through either financial, emotional support, caregiving support, etc. And secondly, um, the sort of minimal standard we have for parental status anywhere, which is, would recognizing status here be clearly harmful to the child? Clearly harmful beyond, you know, interfering with parental rights. So, the abuse and neglect sort of standard. Other questions? Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, so you've got these co-parenting agreements which are generally not recognized or only in rare circumstances. Um, there's no same-sex marriage in most of the country. There's no uh, domestic partnership in most of the country. And with, since I refuse to accept the answer, there is no answer, what do we do? This is just a case out of Utah. Um, not a friendly state for these sorts of things, where <laughs> they, you know, there's no same-sex marriage, there's no domestic partnership. Um, the couple went in and got co-guardianship orders. When the relationship soured, they entered into a written visitation agreement. They, uh, they had uh, informally child support. Then a case came down from the Utah Supreme Court saying, we don't recognize um, quasi-parental status. Uh, and the next, you know, and literally four days later, one of the parents said, I'm cutting you off. The parents said to the, to the non-parent partner, I'm cutting you off. Um, and at that point, it's, it's being challenged in court, but it's an uphill battle, saying maybe the visitation agreement is sufficient. If you're, if you're in a really hostile state like Utah, um, you know, I, you know, you asking my advice, I'd say move to another state. I really, you know, these, these are couples who have done everything they reasonably could, and and they're being, you know, the combination of the state's host, the state and the court's hostility, and the willingness of one partner to cut off the other one, um, is being enforced. And I don't know anything other than you just got to get to a different state. Um, you know, that of course creates its own trick. I mean, I don't know how familiar you are with the, the the case where the where the partners received a civil union in, in Vermont and then and then you know and then actually had the civil union dissolved and there was a, a child custody order and then one of the partners moved to Virginia and said, hey, you know, Virginia doesn't like civil unions, uh, has a state constitutional amendment. I'm gonna get my own child support award that comes out the other way. And eventually that you know that's still pending. It's a, a cert case before the Supreme Court, but the you know the Eventually, Virginia said, you know, there is a valid child order here, and we must respect it, even if we don't respect civil unions. But it's tricky. The problem is that people are going to move. And you can, you know, even if the parties move from Utah uh, to Connecticut, you know, one party might then move back from Connecticut to Utah. And you're going to, we're going to, you know, eventually be facing some very serious um, cross-jurisdiction issues on this. So even moving to a friendly state, you know, may or may not be a permanent answer. Uh, they've tried arguments like that. In fact, in the Michael H. case, uh, the case about the adulterous father, the argument was made and received some sympathetic treatment in the courts below, but this is about the child's interest in, in maintaining contact um, with the other person who had acted as a, in that case, a genetic parent who had also acted as a parent. Um, and it was, it's been mostly swatted aside in all of these cases. It's a, you know, where, where the case comes out, for exclusion, we're going to exclude the other party. It's usually based on legal and state statutory and constitutional parental rights of the parent, <coughs> combined with a narrow reading of who has standing uh, to even seek visitation. They always say whether visitation would be in the best interest, but we read the statute so narrowly that you shouldn't even be here in court, no matter how much you have been involved or how much the child has been involved with you. So to have standing, the non-biological parent would have to enforce the contract first? 
Well, it's not, it's, not, it's not just a general due process question of standing. It's a question of the statute says only, ex, you know, only people, this limited group of people can seek visitation. And so the child can't seek visitation, and no one can seek visitation on behalf of the child, only someone in this limited set of roles narrowly defined. You call on people, you don't get called on. Coincidentally, just this morning I was reading the Utah Supreme Court case, uh, and your comment reminded me of it. That's what, uh, now, in what I shall call Brian's world, let's assume <laughs> that um, premarital contracts between uh, non-marital cohabitants are absolutely enforceable. You say they haven't been enforced. Now they're absolutely enforceable. If that were the case, would you prevent courts from doing what the uh, Utah court uh, condemned, and that is reaching into the air and claiming to rely on equitable uh, jurisdiction, whatever that means, and rejecting the incremental development of the common law and create such almost indefinable things as de facto parents, parents by estoppel, psychological parents, and whatever anybody happens to want to call a parent. Would that, would, would the solution of your dilemma uh, help us to stop avoiding that kind of thing? Stop avoiding, well, you need to stop avoiding it at all costs. Um, <laughs> Very clever. My, uh, you don't know about Abramson in New Jersey and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, I worked for a court in New Jersey once. Um, they never do equitable stuff. Uh, first off, Brian, I don't know which Brian you're speaking about. Brian's world is not a world where anything you write in a premarital agreement is enforceable. Um, certainly not as regards children. Um, you know, in, in the great deontological moral philosophies, you know, Kantian, Thomistic, or whatever, where they find absolutes and they get very uncomfortable with the absolutes. They create equitable rules. They create things about, uh, um, you know, do doctrines of double effect and things like that. If you paint yourself into a corner, you want a way out. Now, you know, the, the question is whether the courts of equity, which have always been the way out, people are finding the way out, uh, the courts of, you know, whether, whether you want a court, you know, whether you want to get, you want to have a way out in the hardest case. That's why you want to have unconscionability as a possible you know, recourse in contract law, but you don't want it used every time something looks a little bit unfair. You, you know, if, the, the, if the statutes look really bad and people who, you know, and, and people's parental rights and children's rights uh, are being badly harmed, you know, uh, I want to have the court being willing to have that access. Now, if we have co-parenting agreements enforceable where people have less need for uh, quasi-parental status, yes. Because, in fact, that's what's happened, is because courts have been unwilling to rely on the contracts, they say, no, we're going to rely on quasi-parental status in which they are more comfortable. No, I think absolutely. If you can, if you can go the other <coughs> way, it'll be easier. Well, I think that Professor Bix has actually elicited many more questions than most of our speakers makes me think that uh, he did a fabulous job, and I want to thank him.